Yep. All right, let's get started. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the uh, Hub 88 uh, Autonomous Vehicle uh, Panel Discussion. It's great to see you all here. My name is Matt O'Sullivan. I'm a board member with Hub 88, and uh, I've also been helping to uh, coordinate much of the uh, activity with the communications lab uh, that we were setting up for our ecosystem. So we're, we're very excited as we look to uh, continue our collaboration with uh, Nokia. Uh, we, we appreciate all the work that you've done to support uh, Hub 88 and all of your engagement. And uh, as we work to drive our mission to uh, pull together technology and the business community, help to drive economic development for the region, and also to connect both of our education uh, and the students and learning to make sure that we have a pipeline of capability and a uh, uh, talented workforce to help drive that business development activity. You know, we're excited to bring all that together uh, with Hub 88 and our ecosystem. One of the uh, quick announcements that I'd like to make today is that we are pleased to announce that in the collaboration that we've had with uh, Nokia, we are now formally opening up our uh, communications lab. You can see at the, uh, on the screen the uh, pre-5G pre and 5G ready uh, labs that, will be, uh, that are available now, in both indoor and outdoor capabilities. Um, you can see for you, for you those that are interested to get some of the technical specifications in there, but you can see uh, an overview of the areas that the outdoor lab will cover. And um, David, if you wanna hit the next slide, please. It'll, you will see that in the, um, David, you're able to, uh, <laughs> it's working. <laughs> Obviously not a 5G communication going on with this, uh, uh, this here. But um, so what you'll see as we uh, work through, we've got a pretty good coverage in the uh, outside area to help get the labs running. And, and uh, with the facility here in the, we'll call it the back parking lot, there's a, a, a facility that is also available uh, which would be very uh, lend itself well to a lot of the work with uh, with uh, autonomous vehicles. So we're really excited about that development, and I think it's a, a perfect segue going into uh, our panel discussion today. And many of the different use cases, whether you're working on a vehicle itself or or an app or a whole range of other types of of uh, capabilities, and that the new communications technology will be be bringing. So with that, I would like to uh, introduce Jerry Quant the uh, executive director of the uh, Illinois Autonomous Vehicle Association. And Jerry will go through and uh, introduce the rest of the panel. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me okay? Excellent, fantastic. So my name is Jerry Quant. I'm the executive director of the uh, fairly newly formed Illinois Autonomous Vehicles Association. We are about a year old. Um, we, our focus and our mission is to elevate Illinois and the companies within Illinois um, around everything connected and autonomous vehicles. Uh, we do that through three pillars. One is implementation of, of deployments. Um, so we bring private sector partners who are creating real world business solutions together uh, with public entities to actually build nascent deployments. Uh, and then we step out and let them build those and we then help them expand those. The second pillar is education. So we not only do our own facilitation of uh, educational events once a month at the Connectory in Chicago. Um, we also then participate and bring uh, members and partners together uh, to have conversations just like this all over the state. Um, and we do that with public entities as well. So we help educate public entities around this technology and its use cases. And then the last is we provide um, for the industry as a whole, we're able, because we're involved in sort of all of these different parts of it, we're actually providing sort of a forward-leaning market leadership role, um, not just here in the state of Illinois, but because we have so many companies that are leading the way around the world uh, right here in Illinois, we have the ability to provide that sort of comprehensive leadership and thought leadership uh, for, the, for the country and for, um, for the world in some instances. So it's pretty exciting stuff. Um, I'll be sticking around after the talk. So if anybody has any questions or wants to know more, I'll make myself totally available for all of you. Um, 
Tonight, we have a great panel. Uh, we're going to be talking all about um, the connectivity of vehicles. And, you know, a lot of a lot of folks in the audience probably have varying levels of, of knowledge around this, but you'll see in our conversation, and we're going to do sort of a question and answer panel period, and then I will spend some time at the end to open it up to questions from the audience. But what we're going to do is we're going to start from the vehicle itself and talk about some of the communications that happen from, from the vehicle itself. And then we're going to talk about sort of the infrastructure, the infrastructure and other things that the vehicle, that the vehicle can interact, can interact with interact to help inform it. Um, and then we're going to talk to really V2X communication, not just for the sake of the vehicle, but what the vehicle can also communicate out to the rest of the world. Um, and then at the end, we'll kind of wrap all that up with some talk about security uh, and, and data security and some of the, the realities and advancements that are happening. To do that, I'm not going to do a lot of the talking. I get to do a lot of the questioning. Um, we brought a very uh, illustrious panel of, uh, uh, of folks from each of those sectors. So, um, and I'll let them sort of explain themselves very briefly um, after I introduce them. But we have Kristen Grievous from Autobahn AI. Uh, we have Joe Renz at the end from New Mobility Consulting. And we have um, Sh Shobit, Shobit, sorry, uh, J Jane, Jane yeah. uh, from Here Technologies as well. So I'll let each of you just take a moment and introduce what you and your company does, uh, and then we'll get into the questions. Uh, I guess we can start. So uh, my name is uh, Christian Gibbs. I'm the CEO and co-founder of uh, Audubon AI. Uh, we are building, shipping, and enabling uh, self-driving trucks for the mass aftermarket. So uh, our goal is to address the vehicles that are already off assembly line, the ones that, for example, last 15 or 20 plus years. We believe there's a, a, um, an, an entire component that's being overlooked uh, in this market for autonomous vehicles um, where we want to improve the safety of the of the vehicles are kind of already on the road with uh, outfitting them with a retrofitable uh, system that can upgrade that vehicle to be autonomous on the highway and heavily assisted um, for a human driver to drive it off the highway. All right, thank you. Um, so I just uh, trying to remember this building because my first time I was in this building was in 1999. It was my first internship at uh, Lucent Technologies at the time. And the second time I came here was like just three weeks ago. We were here for an innovation session with some of Nokia and Hub 88 was also involved. This is my third time, so what are the chances of coming back again <laughs> in two weeks in a row? Um, so I am Shobit Jen. I'm part of Hair Technologies. Hair Technologies traditionally make maps. Uh, used to be called Map, uh, map Tech back in days. It got by by Nokia, and uh, it went through a lot of evolution stage. Um, it's uh, not we have OEM, um, uh, conglomerate who is our owners. But what is, uh, I think the here strategy is uh, really thinking in terms of not just math, but really in terms of how do we solve you know, market problems. And the way you do it is really become a platform company. Um, as a platform company, you want to make sure that we have the right tools, we have the right technology, and we have the right maps, which allow us to really you know, be uh, flexible in terms of the market problems that we can solve in the future and the problems that we need to solve right now. So that's kind of our vision, going from mass to a platform company. Um, for, my pers for my role, I uh, lead uh, innovation uh, for our content business, which is one of our many businesses. Um, content has really has been driving over, you know, all of our platform opportunities. Um, my job is not to about creating what or how, it's, it's about why. Um, so sometimes a very annoying job in my company. Um, all I do is ask questions. Why we need to do this? Okay, it's just because we got 5G, why? Just because we can, should we? And it really goes back to, you know, innovation starts with um, really understanding the, the market problems. If you're able to really think in terms of market problems that you don't have a goal, you have a vision, and you bring the vision in terms of understanding, okay, how we need to create the right competencies into the company, or work, more importantly, work with, you know, partners and cities, um, different technology companies, and really allow an ecosystem to really you know, help the market problem. So that's, that's my job, and I'm uh, glad to be here, and I'm really happy to, to talk to, to this great panel. Good evening, everyone. My name is Joe Renz. I'm with New Mobility Consulting. We uh, envision, inspire, and co-create the future of mobility, also known as the new mobility world. New mobility for us is connected vehicles, autonomous vehicles, uh, smart cities, but there's also the services that connect all of this, and then the e-mobility component. It's obviously a very broad field. We do innovation consulting for large corporations who 
we're trying to deal with the digital disruption that is currently happening, for example, in the automotive industry. And we also work with young companies that are trying not to only to penetrate a market, but maybe try to get into a vehicle. How do I get into a mass produced vehicle of any type? And so we provide some guidance and consulting and help in that area. Glad to be here and looking forward to this panel. Excellent. Thank you guys very much. I appreciate it. Let's kick this off by talking about um, what are some of the types of information that connected and autonomous vehicles are capturing today? Um, and, and if you can expound a little bit on what is actually being used to move the vehicle and what is information that's just, for the most part, thrown away. Because I've heard that companies talk, autonomous vehicle companies talk about, we only use about 10% of what we capture to move the vehicle safely down the road. Um, so what are some of those things? And Christian, maybe you can kick us off, seeing as though you, you build the vehicles and you collect the information. <laughs> sure. Uh, I, I, would, uh, I would say that it's on the lower end of the total amount of data that's truly, uh, for example, unique uh, and kept um, for the purposes of training, in our case, say, the, the AI that uh, actually guides the vehicle. Um, but the indirect information that's generated from, uh, from our vehicles or from any autonomous vehicle uh, is the, the inference and understanding uh, of that environment around the vehicle. So what's really kind of the the very pertinent uh, component for going into a very connected future is that these vehicles are now able to report um, data from various different roadway conditions, uh, accidents as they happen, um, or what the state of the vehicle itself is for kind of telematics or dispatching purposes. Um, there's like a wide variety of ways that data can, can be used. Um, and for example, one way that uh, we're using this data or this kind of byproduct of uh, the autonomous system um, is we're actually providing uh, third party logistics companies or fleets with a very accurate way of knowing where their vehicle is or what that vehicle is going through at any given point in time. Um, so when, for example, the truck arrives at a given um, facility and you don't know which door to go to, that information that the vehicle's understanding that this kind of this, sensor, this part of the sensor data is a building, this set part of the sensor data is something else, it's able, you're able to communicate um, much more effectively with the people trying to perform the job. So anybody in the context of um, you know, IDOT or any Department of Transportation who wants to know what the condition of their roadway is at all times, that's kind of what the data from autonomous vehicles will be able to uh, help and enable. all this different kind of data, if I were, I mean, there's just tons of attribution, like you said. I mean, the, the amount of sensors we have in our car now is like 10 times more than like 737 back in days, right? <laughs> um, so the proliferation of data makes sense. What we do with the data is, is really becomes a challenging task. Uh, but if I were to kind of summarize, the, the way I see it, I think there are really three categories. There's the data, which is sensing the environment. So that's exactly the, the use cases you talk about, the roadway conditions, understanding the, the vehicle to vehicle, um, understanding the, the 3D model with computer vision. Uh, so there's a lot of data that is being ingested. And of course, the, the other, other aspect of data is driver behavior, right? What exactly happened to the driver in the car? And that could be just the driver behavior in terms of the drivers driving the car. Um, and then there's a lot of sensors uh, that are being placed now to even get extract more of that driver behavior kind of data. And, and then of course, what happened to the car itself. Um, and I think uh, we have uh, finding a lot of opportunities in terms of you know, even like roadway conditions, working with municipalities, uh, not just uh, you know, in Chicago or in the US, but across like globally. The question comes down to, you know, is, is again, like the why aspect, okay, what problems what are the key problems we want to solve? And some of the times we are looking from other way around, we're looking at the data, and that we write, we realize that there's a data fragmentation. The straight data is not structured. If you, I mean, we work with a lot of OEMs, um, and then just from you know, Mercedes to Audis, like the data fragmentation is, is insane. Um, so I think we, we have to kind of, not so much in terms of, okay, how we can utilize data, data but which data makes sense for us to enable the right use cases. And in the meantime, you also kind of create that opportunity as an ecosystem, as an enabler that, um, you know, the companies, they can create their own use cases. So um, I think that right now the focus is a lot on the smart cities 
is leveraging autonomous data with municipalities on roadway conditions specifically. That's something we have been really looking into as well. And I think the other aspect is the urban planning. Uh, the congestion is a big issue. Uh, and also for the new cities, like how do we help them with their planning aspects? So with the parkings, all those kind of um, localization of, of even some of the assets. So I think those are the, the two major use cases that, that we're trying to leverage using um, a lot of the, the, the sensing data of the cars. Uh, I don't know the level of details that you know about current technology, so I just want to give you a quick couple data points. So, for example, current vehicle collects four terabytes per hour of operation. So these data, this data incoming is, is collected by the cameras, by other sensors that are on the vehicle. And uh, as data is the new oil, the economist talked about this uh, in an issue not too long ago. And with the success of Google and Facebook and others, the OEMs have started to realize data is actually valuable and we should hold on to it. So what happens in, in Jerry's case, he has a Volvo. So at, at night, the, the data gets uploaded into a data center somewhere in Stockholm or in Sweden somewhere. And I use Volvo only because most people don't see Sweden as such a big threat to the United States. But if you read his T's and C's in his vehicle and actually happen to do that, it says that the data will be shared with people that are not using the same data privacy laws that the U.S. and Europe has because Volvo happens to be owned by a Chinese uh, conglomerate really. And so the data ultimately goes there. What I have a problem with this is that a lot of this is four terabytes is completely irrelevant data. If I imagine myself being a vehicle right now and looking at this audience, there's all these chairs that if I took a picture once, that would be good enough because those chairs will hopefully not move in the next hour and a half. So, but I still take all this data in in a very high definition and then I put, dump it into a big data lake or into a big database and then maybe one day an engineer has time to actually look at this. Instead, what we propose is uh, this average vehicle in S-Class of 7 Series has 100 of these ECUs, so 100 PCs are effectively on the vehicle. If we can take the data in with the sensors and then process it very quickly, on board in the vehicle. And by the way, 96% of the time the vehicle sits in a parking lot. So this, these data centers on wheels are sitting everywhere. So we could very easily leverage this information, get the gold nuggets of information, such as black ice outside of this building, communicated to the vehicles in the vicinity, because no one in, in Stockholm or in China cares about black ice today at 5 p.m. other than the people that are driving out there. So if we get the data that we're collecting into this point of making it really in context a valuable uh, data point, then it becomes valuable monetarily as well. And here is looking at some of those technologies to say, hey, I'm going to push this out as a service, for example, in a parking lot situation. 30% of all city traffic is someone looking for a parking spot, 30, three, zero. If the sensor picks this data up, and I know it's contextual again, it's Friday night, it's date night, it's raining, there's a pricey restaurant, that parking spot outside is going to be extremely valuable to a seven series uh, BMW driver, maybe not for another consumer. So if I have this data and the car picks this up, it has to be communicated in real time on the edge in the fog. And that's where 5G, which is one of our topics, is going to come in extremely handy. So if I'm hearing correctly, there's a ton of data. And I'm just trying to summarize from all three. There's a ton of data coming in. Um, there is some fundamental data that absolutely needs to stay on the vehicle because it's proprietary to the safe and efficient operation of the vehicle. There's some information that's actually being collected that's useful for um, the ongoing maintenance of the vehicle. And then there's information that actually should be shared out because it's actually increasing the safety and the safe operation of this vehicle by communicating certain data points to vehicles in its, in its local proximity. Right, um, and you guys did a good job of articulating why some of that is instantaneous, some of that is long-term, uh, and some of that is short-term. Let's talk a little bit about, and you guys have touched on a little bit, the environment outside, right? And the need to capture sort of this physical environment. Um, here is just launched an open source platform. Yeah. Um, and I think you'll be able to speak to this better than I can, but I think the intent is to start gaining a clearer picture and enabling the, the digital environment to gain a clearer picture of what the environment is. And I think one of the examples, um, and Joe touched on this just a moment ago, is as vehicle A is traveling down the road, it's utilizing a map, 
that has been loaded onto the vehicle. And it will identify and juxtapose that baseline map with now what is visually seen. But we're not really seeing vehicles today then identify the anomalies and share that information out, mm -hmm. correct? But that's sort of the intent of this open sourcing of your platform. So can you talk a little bit more yeah, about what sure. that is? So yeah, open location platform is um, something that we started working like two, three years ago. And um, it's actually a pretty good way to summarize the, the oral vision of open location platform. Let me start with a specific use case and sure. then I kind of get into um, some of those, like how we're trying to solve some of those, um, uh, the market areas. So uh, we are working with this company called um, uh, Nira Dynamics. They basically provide uh, uh, re like real, um, uh, any kind of like uh, car wheels, uh, logistics, so like tire pressure, uh, or even like there's a, the, the wheel nuts, if they're loose or not. And one of the use cases they've been looking in terms of like how to find the slippery roads. Um, and they really want to provide as, as, a, as a notification alerts to the drivers. So um, they have a you know, software, it's a software company and they have software that collects the data. Um, and the, use, the, the big issue is that they don't have to manage that big data. They have a lot of data, like you said. There's a tons of data. They don't have the right tools, geospatial tools or processing big data management tools. And they don't know how to create the insight, the high fidelity layer, which is not about the data, but provide the contextual alerts to the driver that, hey, there is a, a so it's a more friction, it's a less friction road, and this is something that you can provide uh, to the driver in advance uh, notification. So that's a use case that we're actually working with the company right now to solve it. And what we're basically doing is we're creating this open location platform where you can bring your data or you can leverage uh, our data, our location libraries that we provide in-house, or you can work with third-party data. So it, it really makes it open location. And we have the tools, we have the big data management, we have the processing tools, we have analytics tools, and we have the geospatial uh, uh, processing um, uh, libraries. And we can create a workplace, workplace where you can use uh, with our tools and data to create specific use cases. So, in the end, you're creating value for your own consumers. And that's where uh, we are working uh, in uh, very, we launched last year, October 2018, with in a closed beta. So we launched with specific companies and we're launching with um, at an open location platform release in H2. And uh, so it's, it's really letting the problem of solving the, the, the data silos, is not, not having the right tools to uh, able to uh, leverage the reality index over, over maps, but also leveraging their own data to create uh, uh, the high fidelity use case for, for their market. Uh, so uh, we right now, um, we're working very closely with not just OEMs, but very you know, different markets. We're working with, like I said, uh, some companies which are providing uh, the ecosystem to automotive, but we're working with municipalities. We're working also, uh, which is a great, great, uh, a new concept that we are leveraging to, to work on um, agriculture industry as a, as a pilot uh, for precision farming. Uh, so yeah, there's a, there's a lot of, um, uh, I think, things that we need to use as a way to create a feedback loop so we can actually evolve the platform over the time. Uh, but I think in terms of the vision is really to, to create this open uh, and where you can bring your data in leveraging over data to create whatever the value you want to create for the end user. So Christian, can you talk a little bit about how your software and your product offering um, utilizes those maps, you know, whether they're from here or from, and, and how platforms like this are starting to evolve and help you provide again, safer, more efficient routing operation, sure. all those fun things. Sure. So uh, the most kind of basic uh, use case, uh, would be ar uh, around maps that provide uh, lane context. So in a given part of the road, how many lanes are there and what their positions are, what the width of that lane is. Is that lane about to merge? Is that lane about to split? Um, very often, so you see uh, construction workers, um, you know, put construction barrels out uh, on the road and that actually might not even be coordinated um, or notified yet to companies like us. Um, we've had a couple of occurrences like that before, but. Primarily, um, there, there's, there's two parts 
that are absolutely needed. That's it's the part of the constant ecosystem of a of a map, uh, through, for example, through the open location platform, that's constantly feeding in data from various different vehicles. Um, but at the same time, the vehicle itself um, cannot be solely dependent uh, on that because um, unless every single vehicle on the road is within a given distance, for example, the distance of the sensor range itself uh, on a certain vehicle, then it's not realistic to completely rely on that crowdsourced map as, uh, for the most recent updates. So the vehicle itself needs to be able to infer um, what, that, what it's seeing on the road and be able to then make its own wise decisions on uh, recognizing the various different types of anomalies or I don't know if you want to call them anomalies, but uh, you know, construction barrels being laid to close down a lane or, or triangles from a truck uh, being put down and sometimes those aren't even put the proper way. So the vehicle needs to have that kind of onboard knowledge and brain power to be able to deal with that. So what I'm hearing from this is one of the challenges is, is as all of these systems are being developed, there's obviously a gap in interoperability. Joe, can you talk a little bit about sort of that that Uber challenge of interoperability and, and, and how we're looking to overcome those and, and some examples maybe? Yeah. So we talk about the system of systems. Let's go back to the old days where we shipped the product, you know, and then we made the product a little bit smarter. We made the product connected. And then we get to a product system. And the best example I can give in the new mobility context is Tesla. So instead of just building the electric vehicle, Elon understood, you know, he has to have a charging infrastructure. He has to have over-the-air updates. He has to have the tiles on the rooftop to, to charge the power wall. And so now you really have a system where you can interact with your customers. And we talked a little bit about this in the briefing on creating an experience, right? It's no longer that you just get a car and then you worry about charging, but it's a product system. But ultimately it will become a system of systems. This internet of things that we all hear about, it's going to come to a reality where everything is interconnected. And it's not just us humans, but the machines will start talking directly to other machines. And what that then creates is an issue of trust and an issue of is this data the real deal? Is this data manipulated? Because if I use the, 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 the previous examples of a crowdsourcing map, I mean, look at Waze. When the Chicago weather turns bad, what happens is one person drives down a service road and says it's a good road. All of a sudden, Waze starts routing traffic through these service roads. And the service roads are there for garbage trucks and, for, and are very narrow. So if Christian comes with his 18-wheeler down the same road. This is not a good situation. So open sourcing these platforms are all relying on the integrity of the data and also the data in context. What might be good data for him is not good data for the next person. And so what we need to do is create an environment where the data can be trusted and the data source can be trusted. So it's not a 14-year-old in his basement pretending to be a pothole on, on I-88, but it's really a pothole that comes from a vehicle that we know and recognize, and we know this is an authentic uh, situation here. And obviously the potholes is, a, is a, not as critical an example as some of the other examples that we have. And so ultimately we become a system of systems, which with the Illinois Autonomous Vehicle Association we're pursuing because we're not waiting for autonomous vehicles to drive down the street at level five. We're starting to build this infrastructure, which again, 5G is a critical component. Let's talk about that for a little bit. Um, so as we bring this into sort of the connections platforms, and Hopefully this is where the rubber meets the road for a lot of folks that are really engaged in the, the, the telematics por portion of this. You know, there's a sizable national debate happening right now on is this 5G gonna be the savior of all communications for, and do we need to wait for it in order to really have autonomous uh, connected technologies come to life? Um, there's another side that says, no, our, our current DSRC infrastructure has the ability to um, manage and operate uh, that and service that. And you have municipalities who are going, well, which should we invest in from an infrastructure standpoint, um, which I often laugh at because, you know, I keep thinking, why is a municipality investing in its infrastructure? Just dictate what the infrastructure needs to be. <laughs> and then let the private company set it all up because they're going to be the ones making the money off the data anyway. Public entities aren't, uh, but it, I digress in that. Is it going to be DSRC? Is it going to be LTE? Is it going to be 5G? If you're Trump, is it going to be 8G? Um, so comment on the debate from your perspective. Yeah, uh, 
for my end, I, I think it's going to be a combination of all. So, so for us, um, making use of uh, LTE is, uh, is sufficient enough for uh, basically what's kind of referred to as edge computing. So all our computing um, for, for our 18-wheelers uh, happen within the vehicle itself. So there, there's a Jeep graphics you know, processor on it um, that's able to compute uh, numbers very fast. But at the same time, um, 5G will enable things um, like having more real-time notifications for, and for an 18-wheeler that's traveling with 80,000 pounds 60 or 70 miles an hour, uh, it takes about two to three football field lengths um, to stop. So even if you're in the rightmost lane and in an emergency lane, you don't yet see that there is a vehicle, for example, pulled over with their hazards on and they're not completely even just, you know, all the way on the, the emergency lane. Having that type of information, it's currently possible through LTE, um, but it could be, you know, even faster with, uh, with 5G or you could get an immersive picture um, with, uh, through a higher bandwidth with, with 5G of you know, a 3D representation of what a thousand feet or 2,000 feet ahead um, or, and the horizon of your vehicle, what, what does that um, look like? So I think there's a, we've, I've had a discussion with one OEM that um, says they are not, they're not thinking about pursuing onboard um, computing for their autonomous vehicles um, and having it all be remotely um, remotely driven um, through this 5G connection. And there's a there's a definitely a, a use case where that is a, will work or where that is, is applicable. But that completely relies on, um, or at least the widespread adoption uh, relies on how quickly 5G itself, um, since it's a much shorter communication um, radius, how quickly can it get deployed across the entire United States? Yeah, um I agree. I think it's going to be a combination of all of them. It's not an either-or discussion. It's not a, a black or white discussion. Um, I think 5G is, of course, uh, I came from a telecom company, and I, the, the internship I did was on a UMTS uh, base station. Uh, so I, I, I'm, you know, it's very exciting to see the progression of 2G, 3G, 4G, but the rules of the game were the same. You know, it's more speed and, you know, and more capacity. And I think 5G is changing the rules of the game. It's really focusing on the low latency. It's very exciting, uh, you know, because, you know, with the IoT proliferation of, you know, not just the IoT, but system of system, it, it'll be omnipotent. It'll be given that the low latency has to, you know, that's the future. And, and especially with 6G, 7G, who knows? Um, but I do think that that doesn't mean that, you know, we have to wait for that. I think there is a DSRC component, which is vehicle to vehicle, which is highly you know, important for real-time collision information or any kind of real-time low latency interaction. It's also very easy to deploy. Uh, there could be a retrofit. You can really go after APAC, like, you know, emerging markets. And I would also think in terms of even like taking a step back, the problems that we need to solve right now. So if you look at the cars, 80% of the cars in, in, in US, I would say 90% of the cars still doesn't have any ADAS or any kind of assistant driving system. If you go to, you know, India or any other Southeast Asian companies, like 95%. Uh, what do you do there? Mm -hmm. So we're working on a technology uh, where it's, it's basically computer vision, object detection on the uh, smart mobile. It could be on a dash cam. It could be any, any um, you know, low computing device and there's no connectivity required. And it's doing the computer vision, just like how you would do uh, leveraging your high end sensors. And it's just letting the consumer know, hey, there's a pedestrian, here is a, you know, a pothole. Uh, there's an oncoming traffic, which happens a lot in India. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and then you can use your LTE connection or even 3G connection to almost like automated ways. So uh, here's a pothole. And if I'm connected through mobile SDK or any kind of other platform, uh, if they have the same uh, computer vision on their phone, they will get the notification. So a person who is, you know, like three miles behind me, uh, get a notification, hey, watch out for that. That, that traffic or watch out for that pothole. So, you know, this is where the world is, is and it's gonna be how the world is, will be that. It would not be, you know, where, uh, like, you know, you turn on the switch and we are just kind of, you know, have everything relying on 5G. Um, and I really think that's where the power of innovation will come in. We, before we solve the future problems, we have to solve, solve the problems of the past, uh, not even the current. There's a, there's just, just go and look at the markets directly and you see like there are still so many problems to be solved in a way where we can actually 
you know, really adapt technology in the right way. It, just to quickly add uh, to that, so in a commercial vehicle space, OEMs are typically even farther behind in their cycles and manufacturing cycles or design cycles than the automotive sector. So by like six or eight years, whatever is being implemented in automotive, that's typically not going to be seen, or at least that, that's how it's kind of been up until now, um, is that won't get uh, implemented in the commercial vehicle sector um, for that much longer. So that, that's kind of why uh, at Autobahn, our focus is kind of addressing this, this present problem, which is there are all these vehicles. They, they, some of them might have, you know, say a, a camera and a radar system that provides some lane departure warning for collision warning. Um, but we actually, one of, the, one of the things that we learned is um, these vehicles are not, for example, updatable, which is I think a very critical component to any technology that's being deployed on these vehicles is having the ability to be updatable or, um, you know, error, error corrected. Um, and for, I, I say that because talking with a lot of drivers, I'm a driver myself, I got my CDL, so I am behind the wheel and I experience these things myself. False positives can, can, for example, automatically break the truck to the point where everything in the truck falls through the windshield. Um, or, or, you know, false positives for uh, lane departure warning, they can start all the audible warnings. And there's no way of even uh, allowing these, um, these technologies to be um, you know, fixed or refined. It's just simply like every cycle, every batch of 200,000 new trucks every year, whatever that state of the equipment is, that's how it is. And that's going to remain that way for 15 to 20 years. Um, so that's kind of where we see that, that area of a need and therefore an opportunity. So I agree on, it's going to be all three. By the way, OEM is original equipment manufacturer. So Chrysler, Ford, whoever ships your car, BMW. Now um, car. I'm sorry? Navistar. Navistar. <laughs> Our neighbors. Just trying to um, localize it. <laughs> if, if you saw, if you see the, the advertisement on uh, TV about some Sprint or any of the other cell phone providers, and you look at the United States, still the largest economy in the world, there's white spaces even on, on that map for the cell phone reception. So clearly, we cannot rely on 5G or any other mobile service only. And it's also going back to the latency. So it has to be done on the edge. It has to be done in the fog. Again, this black ice information is not relevant to Stockholm or to China. It's relevant to the guy or the gal behind me, or when I see the broken down vehicle. And so it has to be a combination of them all. I even think it has to be to a point where the car can be self-sufficient should it lose all connectivity. And you know, we're talking about these systems as if they. Some people think this will never happen. Some people know it's already happening. Here in Illinois, we have Caterpillar who've been driving autonomously in mines uh, since the 70s. So it's not that there's no autonomous vehicles. And if you ever flown anywhere to Europe, for example, the pilot takes off uh, in good conditions. In bad conditions, actually, the autopilot lands. And the, the pilot flies for maybe 15, 20 minutes of the whole flight of nine hours. Now, if I told everyone in the back of the, of the plane that the, the computer is flying, none of, a lot of people would not get on the plane. And they feel comfortable because there's two pilots on that could theoretically take over should connectivity be lost or all electric systems go down, whatever it is. And so this is why trucking, for example, will be the first adapter of autonomous driving because driving on a highway, while it is difficult to Christian's point, is way easier than driving a lower whacker. And so, you know, grandma's not going to cross the highway, hopefully, there's no kid running out, et cetera, et cetera. And there will always be a designated driver, at least in the early days, so who can take over, who's fully trained. And so these big rigs, will see, we will see this adoption. And then the question becomes, do we have to make these cars smart? Because we just heard there's 140 million in the United States alone, or do we make the infrastructure smarter and the infrastructure can tell certain things? And, and one last data point on this ADAS discussion, if every vehicle had ADAS today, so this is the advanced uh, driving and assisting uh, that you have with lane departure with uh, adaptive cruise control, 90, 90% of the accidents would be prevented. Going back to the question of why, why are we doing this? Every single day, a, a Boeing 737 falls out of the sky with people dying on, on our roads. Every single day. And if this would happen on planes, there would be a huge national debate. But if it happens every night, and it happens every weekend when there's a drunk driver, a distracted driver, this is why we're doing this in the first place, right? And, and distracted driving deaths are up in Illinois. And this is only because if you look around yourself, there's always someone typing on their phone because they, they think they can do two things at a time. And we humans are definitely the weakest link in all of this. So it has to be automated. But the question is still, 
how do we automate this from a retrofitting perspective, like Christian is doing it on the 18 wheelers, as well as when do we replace all these fleets with connected vehicles? Let's talk about the connectivity piece. So it's telco companies that actually deploy, but uh, that industry is pretty heavily regulated, right? Um, as, as, we're, as I'm sure many of you in the audience are aware. So from a regulatory standpoint, what would you like to see happen from a communications and tel telematics standpoint? Um, and what sort of uh, role should the government play in providing guidelines around that? Go ahead, anyone. So we have we had this interesting thought experiment that um, if there's uh, the, the way that we are uh, deploying our vehicles for for our customers the trucking fleet is in a kind of very strategic fashion. So for example, Chicago to Detroit, the truck uh, comes from a warehouse that's very close to the highway, gets onto the highway, drives to Detroit, and gets off the exit um, to a very close highway nearby. And so that's about 325 miles. This is just totally like an open thought, but um, a new form of maybe going, getting outside of the, the telcos, um, say they're very slow in their deployment. Um, we had this thought that if there's enough vehicles that travel, um, that are all connected, they have DSRC, or they have the ability to, for example, share information amongst each other, those vehicles themselves can create a mesh network. Uh, and that, that may fill the holes that telcos currently may, may or may not have uh, in various different places like in the middle of Montana or you know, in, in a very um, rural part of Michigan or, or Indiana where five, LTE or 5G might not yet be um, sought out, right? So, so leveraging the network that the telcos have, it may be extended. I'm not sure if anybody has like seen, I think it was like last year's Super Bowl ad, Verizon had a drone that was flying over uh, for disaster relief out in uh, Florida, and that drone was able to broadcast an LTE network. So it's kind of like that same principle of, um, of expanding the network um, reach and the capabilities. So I think to go off with what you're saying, Jerry, I think it's, uh, it's, it, there might be room for additional um, ways that automakers, OEMs, tier one suppliers, or aftermarket suppliers like us um, can actually supplement uh, an additional network for that lack of the infrastructure expansion. So um, I think regulation is something, it's not a new topic. I mean, it's something that uh, um, historically, uh, you don't have to even think of regulation from the connective view technology. It's an issue of te ethics. And I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm a big proponent of, you know, having, uh, uh, you know, the business uh, growth under the laws of, under the right laws, but it's also importance of having the right ethics in terms of a culture. And if you have that, then the regulation should be always a discussion, not because to, uh, you know, to slow us down, but do in a way where we know is this a sustainable model. I mean, I'm just thinking like the example, of, like Titanic, probably not the best example from a competitive <laughs> point of view, but Titanic was like four times bigger ship. And um, if you look in terms of amount of casualties that they have, oh, they have four times bigger ship, but they never have the, the boats, uh, the rescue boats. They didn't, they didn't increase the number of boats. And if you look at the number of casualties, they have 75% casualties more, which is exactly the same ratio. Um, someone would have probably gone and say, you know what, we need to have more boats, more rescue boats. It's a question of ethics because they were going with the law. And I think that's a question that we always discuss it from an innovation perspective. Um, we, need have, we have almost a responsibility to drive the discussion that actually helps the regulation to help work with us and make it faster. Uh, some countries are very fast and they're very you know, forward thinking, like Germany, for example. Um, I mean, you cannot create maps. You have to provide 24 hours. If you like, need to release a map and they're gonna tell, uh, tell you back that they need to create a, a facade, uh, put up some kind of like a white something, you're gonna show that building. And 24 hours, we have to do it uh, as soon as they notify us. So, but we respect that, and that's a great thing. And I think we're going to find a lot of those use cases, but at the same time, we need to create that discussion versus, yes, that's another checkpoint, and let's just go to the regulation. I think it should we come from a business operations. Cool. 
Yeah, at the speed of innovation that we're at, I don't have a lot of faith in our lawmakers uh, to keep up with this. And a good example that's somewhat unrelated is Airbnb, right? So Airbnb launches, and then the city of Chicago notices there's less tax revenue from hotel stays. Why? Because you don't want to stay in the hotel, you not stay at someone's private residency. So they make it illegal because they can't control it. What does Airbnb say? If you get fined, uh, send us the invoice and we'll, we'll pay it for you because we're rich and we can afford it. And this is in a facetious nutshell here for a second, but the question of data ownership is to me the number one question. Going back to data being the new oil, we all carry a phone with us. Um, in exchange of free Gmail and free navigation services, uh, Google has built a multi-billion dollar business as has Facebook, as has Amazon, et cetera, et cetera. And there's different calculations, but it's safe to say that around about $5,000 per year is generated by them from the data that we give them voluntarily for again, exchange of free Gmail and free navigation. And even on the OEM side, there's court cases, you know, John Deere is in, uh, or has been at least in court. If the farmer owns the data or they own the data, if it's a lease tractor, if it's a purchase tractor, GM had the same thing, the software, license agreement that you sign when you purchase your vehicle has some small print that says the data belongs to GM and not to you. And um, in the end of the day, the data is very valuable. And I think it should belong to the appropriate entity that can be in an autonomous vehicles case, the vehicle itself, it could become its own economic agent and you ride for free in, in the exchange of the data. But uh, the regulation part will, will not be something that uh, we will wait for or um, that we will um, have the patience for. Another thing when we're talking about Germany, which is getting in Europe as a whole with the GDPR, this whole privacy act of the right to forget, et cetera, et cetera. There is some interesting uh, challenges there. And because the OEMs understand the data is so valuable, they've become actually very reluctant to put this data through the traditional telecoms because they say you have me by the, uh, uh, you know, by uh, you have control over me and, and you have to, need to have visibility in the data that's coming through. So the Germans, for example, have even discussed to create their own network for the lack of a better term. And uh, then being, I'm German myself, so I can make fun of the Germans. Then uh, being German, obviously, we also have to have a custodian. So Allianz, for example, the insurance company says, hey, wait a minute, this data is valuable. Christian is driving in his car, but I can't see any of the data. So there should be a data custodian. And then we all apply for the right to see Joe's data as he just drove from Chicago to Naperville. And so we're gonna have some very crazy discussions uh, because this is also a global problem we have to solve. This is not something we solve in Naperville or in, in the United States, but uh, the regulations will always be uh, tricky. But in my opinion, again, we should own our own data for starters, and then we can decide to what degree we wanna share this data and in exchange for what? In exchange for services or in exchange for, for money. And then the market will somewhat self-regulate itself, I think. Awesome. I think we have a, some time as we're, you know, just a quick time check. We got a time for a few questions. So if anybody has a question. If you'd just like to raise your hand and we can bring the mic up so that everyone can hear. There we go. Hi, uh, so I just uh, caught on to this point of data integrity. Um, you mentioned like if somebody's texting about like a pothole or something like that, how do we ensure that that does not happen? Yeah, so, uh, you, so I, I still let me just make sure I understand the question. You're saying that if uh, the data anonymity, anonymity, right, like if someone uh, uh, reports there's a pothole, how do we make sure that there's a anonymous aspect to, to that report? Is that the question? You want to make sure it's not, it's not like a fake news. Oh, it's, a, it's, not, it's not a 14-year-old in a basement who's right. just coded yeah, the yeah. fact that there is a, a that it's actually a, an actual event. Right, uh, so uh, I think that's um, I mean, it's a great question and something that we are have, um, at least from a hair technology perspective, and I know a lot of mapping companies have the right tools and sets to, to validate that. Um, we have a um, lot of uh, the probe data that would come along with it. We can also check in terms of the validation. Um, and we have, uh, if we have the right sensors, like with computer vision, the computer vision itself can validate it. And all the time with machine learning, we can say, okay, this is, this is, uh, this, this, this is really a possible. Uh, the ways, the crowdsourcing aspect, which is really reporting, like someone sees it and report it, 
that's where I think the technology would come in play. So uh, the way we're trying to remove some of those issues like false positives or, uh, or, or wrongly claimed you know, reports, we're trying to remove those issues by leveraging technology through computer vision. Back to this, so distributed ledger technology, most people refer to it as blockchain, but I, I talk specifically about distributed ledger technology and Bitcoin is not blockchain and blockchain is not Bitcoin, but there you have the opportunity to identify the source as a, as a true sensor that can pick up a, a pothole. And then you have the immutability of the data stream. So you ensure that the data that's being communicated are not manipulated. So that's one area that we see a lot of use cases and so a lot of the OEMs are exploring this technology at the moment for exactly that reason. Because we're going back to a machine-to-machine -to -machine economy. If there's no one in the media that validates the data, because today you trust the data because it comes from here. But then here, the brand of here and what it stands for is kind of suggesting that the data is correct. But if it comes off the sensor directly to my vehicle, I need to make sure that this is really authentic. And that's where DLT can play a huge role. Could you comment on the assignment of liability in the case that uh, AI forbid that an accident actually happens when you're driving an autonomous vehicle? Good question. Yeah, um, <laughs> so it depends on what level of an autonomous or automated engagement is activated, I think. Um, mm -hmm. For example, at level two, which is a safety driver, like a, a safety driver is still very much required and needs to be very attentive cannot use even their phone or anything like that at that point in time. Um, that's currently allowable on, on the roads right now. Um, Tesla's vehicles are uh, very good level two, or for the most part, very good level two vehicles. And when there is a crash, uh, the person who was uh, in charge of being the operator or that safety uh, kind of monitoring person, they, they're the one that is held liable. Now, when you get down further levels of the automation, uh, for example, when you get to level four or level five, um, we, we developed a partnership, for example, with uh, Toyota's insurance management uh, services to actually have a very, very in-depth discussion as to who, who is it that's actually liable? Is it the software maker? Is it the hardware maker? Or is it the platform provider, meaning the vehicle OEM? So if it's a uh, problem on uh, the software where, for example, AI that is being trained through, you know, uh, various different types of data, like computer vision, uh, the, the images or the radar data, the steering angles, it, the way that AI is now evolving um, in the context of the use of, heavy use of neural networks, um, those neural networks have to have a, like an extremely heavy amount of data and validation across many different miles or, or, or across a very vast um, data set to be able to prove their reliability. So 99.9% .9 accuracy uh, may be tremendously better than a human driver, which is for, in the context of like human driving, it's like 85% um, accuracy for what should be done at any given point in time. But still 99.9999% may allow an accident to happen. And at that point in time, that's really where uh, companies like us or the companies like the OEMs need to have that level of validation and show NHTSA or the FMCSA, look, this is, this is how our system's performing. It's significantly better than a driver, so we can already reduce fatalities. Uh, we still have a while to zero accidents, but I think that's like, those discussions are what really have to happen. I think the government's trying to get a grasp on how to go about that as well. I think we have time for one more question. You mentioned about, uh, and I agree with you, that a lot of this will have to be done at the edge and the fog processing because we won't have the telecommunications. What are you, what are you seeing out there to secure the uh, software that's actually running at the edge and make sure it's not manipulated with, uh, I deal a little bit with the military and they use cell four to manage all their chips and like the missile guidance systems and stuff like that. Something like that coming into the commercial space to make sure that nobody's tampered with the software out there especially now that you're going to be doing over-the-air updates to it. Uh, for me, right? Okay, so um, I, since it's happening on the edge right now and there's no wireless communication that is required for that vehicle to happen, you can isolate that vehicle to have um, no outside communication. But um, 
there are a few companies, um, also us experimenting, for example, with like a remote control takeover in the event that an autonomous system has an issue um, that's kind of just like a safety backup, right? Um, we're not far along in that on, on that development side, um, but we have started talking with Tardec um, and uh, NHTSA, a little bit of with FAA as well, to just at least get an understanding of like, what are the FAA regulations for, for communications? I think that's like when 5G becomes more um, widespread and OEMs start, for example, adopting it to, as it may have the capability to control the vehicle remotely, um, I think that will be a problem separate from edge computing. Um, so I think that's why edge computing is very important to solve first. And I think then the wireless communication would be this additional redundancy um, that can be used in the event that the 0.00001% time fails. Yeah, I, go ahead. But if you think about data, you go up the pyramid, you go from data to information to knowledge to wisdom. And if the AI system ever gets to the wisdom level, and it will, and we collect all the data, and this goes back to my earlier comment about contextual data. If I'm driving down Route 1 in, in California along the cliffs, and I'm with my family, and my heart rate is low because that's my car seat picks up on that, and the, the car would be told to make a sharp left turn, uh, AI will be smart enough to know that this doesn't make any sense because I'm not going to kill my family on this very spot at this very moment. And so th when this wisdom part comes in, th there will be contextual information where this hacking or the uh, fact that there's miscommunication on something, the AI will become smart enough uh, on this to, to recognize it and then uh, disobey this, this direction and this order. Now, again, this, this is going to take a while. Christian certainly is much closer to this than I am. But I, there will be these times where this hackability, the cybersecurity part, will be a little bit mitigated by that as well. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's just uh, I think uh, the edge detection is, is right now focused on the isolation. Uh, I mean, a lot of use cases that we are providing is also is uh, the threats are less because the system is completely isolated. Uh, and then each company is on top of it building its protocol. Uh, here it definitely has a protocol which is leverage um, the connectivity, even DSRC, which is our connected vehicle system. So when you do have LT connection, then within that protocol, you're able to create certain security certificates and, uh, and able to leverage that data, whatever that you need to share, either through the other vehicle or through the cloud. I think the question would come down to the interoperability in the real time, and I think in near term. I think with, with, with of course, with 5G, you know, that, that will, will be helped with the standards, but I think interoperability will be a major issue because the companies are very focused in, liable, in, a, in making that thing secure, but how the system will talk to each other, I think that's the biggest hurdle right now. So it's a proliferation of the use case will become an issue um, in, in order to make sure that uh, we, we keep the system to, uh, secure. And I'll, I'll give you two examples in the state of Illinois where we're learning along those lines is sort of the um, communications um, innovation networks that are coming out of Israel um, and a lot of Israeli startups around communication, you know, again, those, those companies are, are basically staffed by people who come right out of the units, right? So what they do is they're utilizing their military to sort of bring that technology to life. And then when it's ready to be commercialized for mainstream and it's not, you know, the next iteration is happening in the military, they can commercialize it in the startup world. We're starting to see that specifically with Boeing uh, here in the States and in Chicago as well, is Boeing is starting to look at how they commercialize their communications networks that they've developed for the military and how it applies down to this. Uh, it's very nascent still, but again, there's a center of, of expertise that exists um, here in Illinois that is really exciting. And to answer your question, I think not specifically, but a little indirectly. I think a lot of the innovations we're going to see, as we have seen, are going to come out of military direction. I mean, we have autonomous cars because the technology was built for mines, and the government looked at it and said, wow, there's some really great stuff happening out of Carnegie Mellon and Caterpillar. Hey, why don't we put this competition together called DARPA and figure out if we can create a vehicle that can move our soldiers? and in a safer environment and reduce the loss of life. So I think we're gonna see, still continue to leverage a lot of the military development that's happening. Good news is we have connectivity to that, no pun intended. Um, 
with, with some companies that are right here in our own backyard. So again, it gives us another place and another, no pun intended again, hub of expertise in Illinois. And I'd like to finish with the fact that one of the things that makes Illinois very unique uh, in this environment is keep in mind, we are one of the only states out of the 50 that have, I think it's 12 verticals, industrial verticals that make up our, the core of our GDP. When you look at Michigan, there's three, maybe four, right? Automotive, um, uh, tourism, and um, agriculture, small agriculture, lesser to that, but they serve fewer beasts, right? We serve a lot of different entities. And in this world of connectivity that you've heard about with mobility at the core, we are able to serve all those beasts. We're able to, to build all the things that interconnect all these things that have benefit elsewhere in the country. Um, you know, you look at, uh, at states like Florida and California, who we think are at the leading edge of autonomous and connected vehicle technologies, but in reality, they are doing pieces and parts of it, right? Whereas we, within our, our own state, have the ability to have these centers of excellence all across the state. Um, and that's what's really exciting. And so I'll end it with that, knowing that that's what's exciting about Hub 88 and why we are we at the Illinois Autonomous Vehicles Association are very excited to partner because we now have a hub for telecom, telco, innovation <coughs> around smart city and, and with mobility at the hub, but really around smart city initiatives. We have a hub in Peoria around Caterpillar and autonomous stuff that does autonomous and connected vehicles, right? And interoperable because autonomous stuff has been building, uh, been building um, vehicles for a variety of different manufacturers all around the world, right? We have a hub and a center for transportation and of logistics. We are the hub of the United States for, for logistics, right? So we've got all of these sort of variable components that if we put it together as an aggregate, we really have a chance to take a real leadership role, but it's going to take sort of that vision about, about all of us, about where we are as cogs in that big wheel to really make it all come alive. But it's very, very exciting stuff. So I want to thank the panel, each of our panelists for, for joining us. I want to thank Hub88 for uh, sponsoring the Tech Talk. Hopefully it was informative. I know I'm going to stick around for a little bit. So if you have any questions of me, uh, hopefully our panelists can stick around for a little bit if you have any other questions that are specific to us. Um, but thank you again for having us. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Jerry, for the, for the great summary. And I especially want to thank um, our sponsor, Nokia, for all the support you've provided um, to uh, hold events like we've done today. And uh, I especially want to thank all of you for the great interaction, the questions, the participation. Without all of your engagement, we would not have uh, the hub of activity that we've got going. So I just one more time give a great uh, round of appreciation for our panel. Thank you.